Hello everyone, it is time for this week's live stream. Uh, before we get into the topic of choice, which was requested again by one of you, I wanted to share with you something that happened to me yesterday. Just give me one second here to grab this and tell you a story. Because you guys love stories. All right, dropping my images to my computer so I can throw them on the screen. And let me find those. Got to show this to you. Hi, Quentin. Paul, are you really old or are you just calling yourself old? Sup, HTC148. I'm sure that stands for something. Hi, Elmer. <laughs> Holland. Ah, love Holland. I know this sounds very cliche, but I love tulips. <laughs> so, and I visited Holland before. All right. Um, first picture I want to show you is this. So I'm going to throw it on the screen and maybe we'll throw it on the screen. And I'll shrink it down, give you a sense of scale here. So I received a package yesterday. One of the uh, viewers of this channel heard my discussion a week or two ago and how I'd mentioned how I love mean green zoanthids. And I haven't had any in forever. And this hobbyist went to a fish store and saw them, bought himself some and bought me some, and then offered to ship them my way. And when he reached out to me, he said, uh, is everything okay? And I said, you know, this is really a bad week to ship. It's really cold. It's going to be really cold. And he said, it's too late. It's already happening. And I was like, all right. So then, of course, what do you think happened? Number one, it did not show up on the day it was supposed to show up. It showed up a full 25 hours later than expected and shipping livestock in freezing weather is always dangerous. Here at the time when the box finally arrived, it was 34 degrees outside the night before, actually the entire day and night uh, before was 28 degrees nonstop. It was the weirdest thing. Our temperature didn't go down, didn't go up. It just sat at 28 for, I don't know, 18, 19 hours in a row. And I checked my uh, the app constantly and it kept saying 28 degrees. <laughs> so the box was shipped and got stuck somewhere in a hub or in a warehouse, or in a giant uh, open air spot like I've seen at FedEx before where the wind just blows through and the forklifts are driving like crazy. And uh, finally, the next day, this box showed up. And when I opened the lid, what I saw was what you see here above my hand. The heat pack that's supposed to be inside the cooler was taped on top of the styrofoam cooler. So instead of keeping the contents within nice and warm, it was literally heating the flap of cardboard on top. And then there was a tiny hole poked into the foam also, which is a technique that I still think is kind of weird, but some people swear it's the right thing to do. They poke a hole because those heat packs, they activate with air. And if you take a heat pack and you activate it and put it inside a cooler and close the cooler and, and put tape around it to trap all the temperature and the air within, it will deplete the air and the heat pack will stop heating. I think that's the premise that why the people believe that to poke a hole in the cooler. So they poke a hole so some air can get in, but how much air can get in when you've got a cardboard flap on top and it's all taped shut anyway? So I think the point is rather moot. Now, would you want to poke a hole in the box as well? Actually, I don't think you should poke a hole at all. I think you should probably activate the heat pack, let it sit for 15 or 20 minutes, get a, you know to temperature, and then put it inside. But I'm not a coral seller shipper, and maybe I don't know enough about this. However, I do know it never goes on top of the lid of the cooler. It goes inside the cooler. So this was an epic mistake. Not only did the livestock take a full extra day to get here, which was a humongous problem with a very cold environment, the secondary problem was that the heat pack wasn't even with the livestock. Now, the thing inside was zoanthids, and zoanthids are kind of hardy. But when I took the bag out of the cooler, and I have a picture of that as well, it was well packed. It was not... Um, by any means leaking, but it was 40 degrees. <laughs> Very cold to the touch. I put the thermometer in, it hit 40, and I checked the thermometer a couple more times. I was like, yep, it's definitely 40 degrees. So I took the coral immediately out of the bag. I grabbed a cup of water from my tank, and I put the coral inside the cup of tank water with a shot of one shot, which is a coral dip and let it sit for about five or 10 minutes. And then I just removed it, you know, I shook it off and moved it into my frag system where it had, you know, some decent climate control. 
and I looked at it several times yesterday. I haven't even looked today yet, but they were completely closed up like little tiny nubs on the frag plug. I don't know that they'll survive, but might as well give it a shot since they came all this way. Um, this is one of the reasons why I usually recommend don't order things during the winter. Now, this was a gift. It was from someone that was very well-meaning, and I am not going to complain about their kindness, but the person that packed it at the fish store made a huge mistake. And I do need to get a hold of the store and let them know of that mistake because I don't know if they're doing it with everyone's order, so they just had a weird one-off and just made a goof. But um, that was a, a dumb mistake. <laughs> <coughs> and we don't want to make those kind of mistakes. So uh, note to self. if you And, you know, there's, you know, some debate even about where to put the heat pack. I've always taped the heat pack to the inside of the lid, and then I put the lid on top and I tape the cooler shut to trap the temperature within. Um, if there's corals inside, well, I mean, when there's corals inside, I like to put something between the heat pack and the corals. So I would put in packing peanuts or something to create like a little cushion, a little barrier. So there's warmth, but the warmth isn't sitting on the bag, warming up the bag. Because during the initial part of the trip, during the first hour or two, you don't want it to warm up the bag to 90 degrees or something and then taper off and cool off all the way here. You know, you want it to be okay. But having it shipped during inclement weather is terrible because things can go wrong, as did in my case. It showed up at a full day later, which didn't help the situation at all. Had it got here in under 12 hours, that would have helped. Instead, it was whatever that is, 36, uh, 37 hours later. Um, we'll see what happens. But anyway, just be aware of that. If you're shipping anything, do not put the heat pack on the outside of the cooler, because that's pointless. I changed our angle today because over there I have a whole bunch of acrylic projects that are on the table and there was no room to put all my stuff for the show in that area like I always do each weekend. So you get to see the tank behind me. I'll kind of do this. <laughs> but uh, it's a little blurry because I've got the camera focused on me. Uh, today's topic specifically is going to be about re-aquascaping or rearranging your, your aquascape in an existing reef tank and doing so safely because you may decide there's a change that needs to happen, but you don't want to cause problems with the ecosystem. You don't want to create a mini cycle. You don't want things to die off. You just want to make some rearrangements. And so this is actually a pretty brief topic. It won't drag out at all. The number one thing we want to always do before we touch the tank at all is make sure it's stable. Make sure we're not in the tail end of some process we've been going through. Like we're not on the tail end of killing cyano. We're not trying to treat the tank with vibrant. We're not um, I don't know, we're not doing something. The tank is just fine. But we're thinking, oh, I'd like to make a change here. I'd like to go ahead and lower this rock or add a bridge here or change this or move that coral. And those kind of things can be still a little bit stressful when you know everything's working well. I mean, it's going so well you want to make changes because you're running out of room is usually why this happens. But if you're going to make changes, we want to make sure the tank is very stable in the first place. We do not want it to be going through the throws of something that just happened and then go and attack a new thing, causing more chaos in the ecosystem. I would always recommend to have plenty of salt water on hand so you have extra because you, in the process of doing what you're doing, may need some to basically deal with a mini water change because of what you're taking out and putting in. Um, and uh, I would like to have some kind of containers nearby. I don't want to just take something out of my tank and put it on a towel out in the air. I'd much rather drain water from the tank into a nearby container and then take the rock with the coral out and put it in that container so that way it's still submerged and uh, the bacteria doesn't begin to die off. And that way I can go make my change in the tank itself and then reach into this container and get that rock or another rock in question and place it in the tank. Whenever you're doing these kind of things with your tank, keep in mind too, what's the size of your tank? Are you making a change in a 500 gallon aquarium? Are you making changes in a 16 gallon aquarium because it's all relative it all it scales actually if you were to make a big change in a 16 gallon tank you're going to see some things happen over the next three to six weeks you're going to probably see some decline because it's such a small body of water and just the slightest change can really have an impact on everything so we want to be gradual we want to be logical uh, we don't want to use too much of a chemical in the water, such as let's say you were trying to bond one rock to another with putty, and you're mixing up the putty, and then you're applying it, and you're pressing the rock together, and you're trying to, you know, kind of 
add some texture and you know get it secure in three or four points well a lot of putty used in a small tank like a 16 gallon for example in my little uh, theoretical demonstration versus doing so in a 120 gallon tank or in a 180 gallon tank would be vastly different i would much rather use like one or two or three marble sized nuggets of putty in a very small tank to secure that one rock i'm trying to place in a certain way but if you are dealing with a bigger tank, you can use a little bit more putty safely without causing chaos. Now, what is the putty doing? Well, number one, it's, it's having a chemical reaction as the two parts mixed together. And they can give us some heat. They can give us some toxins into the water. And it can cause your protein skimmer to go a little wonky. So your skimmer that's probably been working just fine all this time suddenly is overflowing and you don't know why. It's because of the amount of putty that's been used in the system. So you may need to dial your skimmer down or you need to uh, do a larger water change at the, the end of the task you're doing. So that way the water is essentially the same and not polluted by the putty you used in the tank. Uh, if you are doing something where it's going to take a while to cure and you can't do it outside the tank, like I'm not talking about like building an aquascape and then it's been sitting on the counter for a week and now you want to plunk it into an aquarium. I'm talking about trying to change the aquascape you have right now and you want to add, like, let's say you want to add a shelf, or you want to add a bridge, or you wanted to add a spire. As you're adding these pieces of putty and glue or, or zip tying it together, you may need to support it for the first day or two. So having some pieces of PVC pipe or acrylic rod or whatever it is you've got that's handy. Some people even use coat hanger material. You know, the plastic coat hangers that are all plastic, no metal in them. They'll cut it, and then they'll use it like sticks to support the rock temporarily um, like um, like crutches, and that way once the uh, putty has hardened, you can carefully remove one or two of those crutches and see if it stays, and if it does, you're good. And if it doesn't seem like it's secure, you may need to put a little bit more putty in a certain spot to give it more time, and again, wait another day, and then try to take out the crutch and see if it'll stay. Uh, some people are very creative in this department, but it's very hard to do when you have livestock in the tank. We want to be aware that things happen that we may not consider logical. For example, you put the putty in the tank and you've got it, you know, and you think you're good to go and then you see a fish or you see crabs picking at it or ripping it apart or biting into it or even glue if you're using super glue gel and you suddenly see a fish eating the fresh glue, the fish will glue its mouth shut with the glue. they will be like swimming around and it's like bolted together and you're thinking, oh, now what do I do? Well, fortunately, most of the time, if a fish were to eat some fresh glue and glue their mouth shut, you can just kind of leave them alone. And within the next two or three days, it will fall off. It will break away. The fish will rub it off. Something will happen and it will come off. It's not like a death sentence. So keep that in mind rather than stressing out your fish trying to catch it because you want to peel this off its lips. Um, just kind of keep an eye on it and see if it takes care of itself, which it may and usually does. Sometimes crazy things happen and you just have to interact, but sometimes we can just kind of take it easy and relax. Now, this week, um, there was a live stream on um, Duke of Coral on Instagram, and he was interview and he was co-doing it, or what should I say, co-hosting it with Greg Carroll. <clears throat> and Greg said, Mark's an interesting dude. And I was like, oh boy, <laughs> that's not a good start, right? And he said... Nothing ever freaks him out. You know, he just he just keeps rolling with the punches. And that's generally true. I, I feel like when you're overreacting, your hair is on fire. When you're freaking out about something, you're going to make bad decisions. But if you can think your way through it logistically is the way my brain clicks. If you're trying to map out how you think things will go, you can then uh, plan accordingly or make adjustments on the fly without rushing. And that's the thing. We don't want to rush into anything because our tanks, they take a long time to get going. They take a long time to look good. We don't want to mess up success because we overreact and do something that would be uh, a major change. And even when we have to do something large like an aquascape change, we want to do it in a way where it has minimal impact on the livestock because we don't want to affect it. If you had a separate tank and you're doing this whole new aquascape in that tank and then you're going to break down this tank, and put everything in here into the new tank. You can take all the time in the world to get that perfect. 
when you're dealing with the tank itself that all the livestock is living in and holding on to, it's a little more tricky. So we want to make sure that we are being gentle with the livestock. We are being careful where we're placing things as we're working. You always need a third hand and you never have enough hands. It just it, No matter how you do things, you're wishing you had a third or fourth hand nearby. So if your tank is larger, you may invite a friend over or a family member, perhaps a teenage kid that can listen. <laughs> that sounds like an oxymoron. But if you can get someone that's you know not too young that can stay focused with you, that can literally help hold up something and not let go of it, that will give you the freedom to work the area with that third hand in place. That's kind of where I'm going with this. Uh, you know, when I did my re-aquascape, or um, I did my my reset, it wasn't really an aquascape. We didn't really change much of the rock. We moved a couple of things, but the core of my foundation, my reef, always stays the same because I set it up right from the beginning. I had a plan and it worked. And every time the conversation comes up about possibly making a change, I'm like, no, there's nothing wrong with the foundation. The foundation is great. I might just want one more rock up high, or I might want to put some kind of a gap through here. That's about it. So I usually don't make much of a change, and that's why my tank tends to have the same consistent look year after year after year. Now, if you were going to add a new piece of rock to your tank, a, let's call it a foreign rock, okay? It's a newbie. It's not been in your system before, and you acquired it however you acquired it, from a hobbyist, from the fish store, you bought it online, um, you have this new rock. The smartest thing you could possibly do with that is put it in a bucket of salt water with a large power head to keep good circulation and leave it alone for two or three or four weeks and just let it kind of stabilize is the best term I can think of. And that way, when you reach in that bucket the day you're going to change your aquascape and you pull out that rock and you put it in your tank, nothing surprising is going to happen because that rock has not had any kind of opportunity to have die off or decay within the core. It's not like a dry bone stone that's gonna do some weird stuff in your tank. It's not something that's been sitting out in the weather for nine months, one you thought you'd never use again, and you decide, oh, I do wanna use it after all because it, it's perfect for this spot. Needs to be basically cured in the salt water. <clears throat> so if you could do that, if you could spend a, you know three weeks or a month, and you can change the water in that bucket a couple of times during that month. You can do a water test to make sure you're not getting any weird readings. You can observe and even smell the rock and make sure it smells okay. That way you know that it's going to be safe to go in your tank. If it smells rank, if it has some weird metal odor to it, if it <clears throat> has black areas that you had not seen before, I would not put that in my tank. I want to make sure it smells like the ocean, looks clean like the ocean, and you, know, you turn it all over and you look at every bit of it and it looks okay. Now, dry rock usually is going to be just fine to use, but it's bone white compared to the rest of your existing system. So when you're adding this one new rock to an ecosystem that's all broken in or mature and looks pretty, it's going to be this huge white eyesore in your tank, and you're going to be thinking, ugh, I don't like looking at it. Um, another thing you might consider is that that new piece of rock that was dry, that you got wet, could actually... Uh, uh, release some phosphate into the water and you might start seeing phosphates and you're freaking out. Why are my phosphates up? It could be coming from the new rock that you got. That's not unheard of. It's not uncommon. Um, some people want to even treat the new rock in the barrel of water or the bucket of water with something to remove phosphate. So when they put the rock in their tank, it's not adding phosphate to the system. You can, or you can just rely on your regular phosphate removal method of, you know, just keeping track of it. Do your water tests every single week and make sure that you're maintaining the right levels. If you start to see a spike, you might need to refresh your GFO. You might have to use phosphate or X. Uh, you might have to do a larger water change, but you can keep it under control. It's not like some um, out of control locomotive that is gonna go off the rails. It's just a rock. So don't let that freak you out. You know, instead think about it and plan accordingly. So that way when you insert this new rock into your tank, the tank doesn't even skip a beat. It doesn't even notice. Um, that's pretty, like I said, this was a short topic. There's not really a lot to it. If you have a rock you're taking out of the tank that has corals affixed to it, having it in a separate container where you can work, you can break off the coral or cut the coral off, 
Um, you may decide to even save the rock that you used to have. Um, and that would be the perfect opportunity to put it inside a barrel of water with a lid on top with a power head. And that way, if there's algae on it, it will just begin to die off and flake off and decay off the rock because it's now in darkness. It's not getting good light like it did under the lights of your tank. And so after weeks and months, you may be able to take that rock out of that bucket and it's nice and clean and ready to use again somewhere else in your system or just to keep handy for the day when you're ready to have more rock. So don't, uh, I never throw away live rock. I don't leave it outside. I don't put it in a cooler in the garage. <laughs> I don't put it in the basement. I mean, it literally always stays in salt water because I like the benefits of live rock. I like the critters, the bacteria, the bugs, the sponges, all that stuff's good. Uh, the micro brittle stars. But if you are trying to clean this rock that you took out of the tank during the change of your aquascape, odds are there's going to be stuff on it that you don't like. It could be bubble algae. It could be hair algae. It could be bryopsis. Uh, it could be a little bit of cyano. Uh, it could be a lot of different things. And by putting it in a barrel of salt water covered where it's in darkness, this will begin to kill it off. Now, you will need to change that water in that barrel several times um, over the, you know, every two weeks to get that waste out of the water. Because remember, we we're talking about the rock sitting in water could develop or, or produce or trap or hoard phosphate. And so by changing the water and getting the, the nutrients and the waste out of that barrel, you will make, it's sort of like being on a lean diet. You know, the better you eat, the healthier you become is what they tell us. And so if you were to put that rock on a lean diet, no light, good flow, changing the water, you will get a healthier rock out of that barrel later. So that's what I would recommend you do. And that's what I do. <laughs> and right now I don't have any extra rock whatsoever. I've used every piece I own. And if I wanted more, I'd have to go acquire some. Um... That's it. Um, if your project is bigger, if you plan to make, you know, if you're not just changing a small corner of the tank, if you're trying to do more, I would try to do it gradually over a period of a few days rather than trying to do it all in one day because all in one day is going to be very hard on the livestock. Now, my little frag tank that I complain about all the time, the water's actually pretty good, but the tank's not pretty. And the other day I went in there with a hose, about three eighths, I think, and I was just siphoning off the algae that's on the rock because none of the algae is holding on. It's basically there. It's hideous, but it's not growing. It's, it's just garbage. So I'm siphoning it out. And then I put a net on top of my tank. I just poured the water through the net back into the tank because I wasn't prepared to do a water change at the time. I just wanted to get the, the algae out. And then I took the net of algae and threw it away. And I did that several times, and I even had big sections of bubble algae that was under all that fuzzy crap. And I that came peeling off the rock easily, too. And I was taking a net back and forth through the tank to capture as much as I could. And uh, I, at the same time, was thinking, eh, there's just some anemones in there and three clowns. They can handle whatever I do. So I was kind of a tornado in there. And it was many hours later when it occurred to me that Caitlin's gobies are in there. They are way, way more uh, delicate and timid than a clownfish or an anemone. And I immediately felt like, oh my God, I probably killed these fish with what I did in that tank. Now, fortunately, those fish were smart enough to go under the rock and avoid the wrath of Milev that came blowing through the tank trying to get all this crap out of the system because I'm sick of looking at it. And I do this every couple of months. I just attack the tank because I can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, eventually I'll get something nice out of that corner of the room. But for now, it's just a holding tank. There's three very healthy anemones in there. There's some gorgonians that are healthy. The clowns are healthy. And the gobies are okay. I got lucky with that. They've been out. They've been a little bit more shy this last week. And I, was, I keep looking for them. And like yesterday, as I walked in the room, I saw both. And they kind of, they saw me coming. And so I've kind of flustered them. Uh, I'm trying to decide what to do with them. Um in the near future because I don't want them in the tank. I want them, kind of want them in their own tank. So I'm kind of playing with a thought of another tank somewhere. I don't know where. People keep saying put it in the building. I really don't want a tank out there because of the glue, the fumes, the, the, the routing, the acrylic shavings, all that kind of stuff. I don't think I need a tank out there, but I'd like to have something nice in here. Maybe something I can dedicate to Caitlin in a corner that um, will be hers. I don't know, something like that. All right, that's it. See, it's a quick, easy live stream today. Look at that. We're only 24 minutes in. My topic is done. 
So let us look at some of your comments and some of your questions and we'll answer some of those. And then we'll wrap this up because I have more things to do today and I'm not gonna do a big long live stream. Alex, good luck with your big tank move. I hope that things go well and that everything uh, is swimming right side up when you're done. <laughs> Jason says this is a great time of year to ship cookies. HTC, I kind of answered this. I would take any kind of dry rock you have, and I would definitely submerge it and get it you know, uh, circulating in salt water for a good four to six weeks before I'd put that in my aquarium. It's, um, it's a known fact that you're going to get all kinds of stuff off that rock, and I don't mean dirt. You know, things, you'll, you'll measure the water, and you might see a really high phosphate level. You may see calcium's a little higher than you expected, that kind of stuff. So getting it into some circulation, changing the water a couple of times during that four to six week period will definitely prepare the rock. And then you can even use live rock enhance, which I sell. And you can put that directly in the, bear, the, the bucket with that rock you have and get some bacteria on it. And that'll help colonize it and get it prepared for when you have to move it into your tank. Uh, Emmanuel, I'd have to go look over there right now to see if it's DOA or not. <laughs> It was definitely shriveled down tight. We'll have to see. Alex asks, is there any benefit to using frozen food instead of dry flakes and pellets? Uh, I use frozen food every single night with my tank. I also like to use nori or flake food or pellet food during the daytime, occasionally like a treat. I uh, My main focus is feeding at night with frozen. There's a lot of stuff inside the frozen food, but and I'd say there's less in the pellet and in the flake. Uh, it's just, it's a totally different, um, the food is completely made differently. And I would say, I mean, I've not done the science on it. Okay. So this is, I guess this is completely an opinion, but something that's been even flash frozen and dried rapidly to be crushed and packed into pellets and stuff. I don't think it has the same nutrient level as it would in, a package of frozen food but then again people often complain about frozen food has binders and binders are holding it together and you don't want that in your tank well i've never worried about any of that in my tank i take the frozen food i thaw it and i pour it in the tank with all the binders <laughs> i don't try to rinse my food i've never have i've always felt like the liquid around the food also has it's liquid food for parts of my reef that are not consuming solid foods so things that are inhaling the food would be able to get some of what I'm putting in the tank. And I've been doing this for 20 years. If uh, I think the whole keeping everything super strict and, and you know, rinsing everything off and washing away whatever was on the food, I, I kind of feel like it's wasteful. And I'm, I don't agree with that method myself. But I understand why people feel they need to do it. I just don't think it's necessary. Michael's saying that um, evolution would literally give us three or four arms. <laughs> Only reef keepers, right? <laughs> You'd see them from a mile away like, oh, there's a reef keeper. He's got four arms. <laughs> uh, Andrew said, did you see the Mile High Reefer video about how he got back to his tank after six months? Yeah, and I did not see, hear why he was away from it for six months. That was the curious part for me. But yeah, I did watch, and he showed his tank. You couldn't see through the glass. I literally have to clean the glass of my tank every single day. And I can't imagine being away from it six months. You'd be carving off the algae off the glass. Alex asks, what's the fair price for dry rock and live rock? Fair? <laughs> In this economy? Uh, you know, dry rock tends to be about 2 to $3 a pound. Uh, the purple rock that's prettier, you know, it's been dipped or painted or dyed in the concrete or whatever it is, that stuff seems to be a little bit higher. And then live rock, you know, could be $8 to $11 a pound. Nick says, any suggestions of having a feather duster with a Melanoris wrasse? I don't recall the Melanoris wrasse being a feather duster eater, but... 
Grasses can go after worms, and a feather duster is a worm with a feather duster on the end. So there is a chance. I don't, I'd have to double check that one, but it may be a situation of either they're totally fine together or they are going to be, you have to pick one or the other. Now, I had a feather duster a long time ago because that's what you got. You got yourself a yellow tang and a feather duster and a clownfish and an anemone. <laughs> that was your tank. And I remember putting in a butterfly and it immediately went after the feather duster. And I was so upset, even though that's completely what a butterfly would do. And I, at the time, was not aware of that. And so I was upset with the fish store owner for because I listed what I had in my tank and he sold it to me anyway. And instead of saying, no, you better not because you own a Hawaiian feather duster. So I don't recall the Melanurus ras being harmful to feather dusters. But please double check me so I don't mislead you. Kat says, I just got some seahorses today and hope they last. Well, I hope they last too. Um, hopefully by now you've already done your research. You know what they need. You know how to care for them. You know that you have to feed them multiple times a day. You know the water temperature has to be a little bit cooler than a reef tank. Um, and yeah, they should live. <laughs> they are not super long lived like fish are, but uh, they definitely are beautiful. Nitrox, if you're going to completely change your aquascape and remove all the raw, old rock out and all the new rock in, that's a whole other battle. Uh, basically, that is a reef reset. That's not just an aquascape. And in that situation, you're going to need a lot of salt water. You're going to need a lot of bins to hold things or giant coolers or whatever you can. Anything can hold water because you're going to take your current rock out with the livestock on it and you're going to put it down into these containers, these reservoirs, these coolers. And you're going to have to put in air pumps and you're going to put heaters in there to maintain them for hours while you're dealing with the tank itself, which you'll then clean the glass on all four sides. And you will probably want to really gravel vac the sand bed to get out as much detritus as you can because all the rock was hiding all those pockets. Now you can literally vacuum the entire sand bed. And you may even need to add more salt water in the tank to continue the vacuuming process to get out all that detritus, depending how old the tank is. And then you're going to put in your new rock in. Well, that new rock needs to be fully cured because all the livestock and the coolers and the, and the bins and the reservoirs, they're relying on that tank to keep them alive. And it, they cannot survive if your tank does a cycle. So by just doing a deep clean and, and vacuuming the sand bed, you will not cause a cycle. That doesn't cycle. There's nothing cycling that. You're, it's like a water change. You're just doing a big one. But the rock that you're putting in that needs to have been completely submerged for at least a month, if not longer. I don't know if this is dry rock or live rock, but you're going to want to put that you know, from the saltwater straight into the saltwater and not have it out in the air very much at all. So what you can do to make it so the water doesn't get really cloudy, after you're done vacuuming the sand bed, go ahead and lay down plastic on top. So that way, and you may have to put something on top of that, like a big platter, like you might serve a turkey on, set that on top of the plastic to keep it down. And then you can add more water to the tank and that will not let the water be cloudy. And then you'll carefully remove all that and start placing your rocks where you want them and start building that aquascape up. And in the meantime, all the livestock has to be checked. You know, you have to watch your fish, watch your corals, watch your temperatures, make sure there's circulation, that you don't see any stagnation issues, that you don't see things stinging or killing each other while you're busy working on the tank and then get everything back into the tank as soon as you can. But you need to make sure your filtration is working. Your flow is good in the tank. Um, that first day lighting will not be nearly as crucial as it will be in the coming days. But as the biggest goal is keep everything submerged all the time. And if you can do that, then as you're taking things out and putting things in, they're not going to have any decay or die off because they are always underwater. But if you leave things out of the water to sit and let the air just hit them, things are going to start to, you know, bacteria is going to start to die. You're going to have sponges that are going to die, even sponges you don't see, sponges within the rock, and they're going to add ammonia to the water. Something you can add to the tank when you're done with your big prog program is to go ahead and add Prime to the system. Uh, Prime is a product from Seachem. It's very inexpensive, and the cap full treats 50 gallons of water. So one bottle of Prime will go a long way. I thought I just saw a bottle of it sitting here on my counter. Yep. Yeah. So here's a bottle from the fish store. Prime is a, 
it locks up ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, chlorine, chloramine. It's kind of magical. <laughs> and I always recommend everyone have a bottle of this brand new in your arsenal every single year. Even if you have a, you know, a bottle with half full, throw it away and get a new bottle. I don't know anything about expiration dates, but I do know a brand new bottle is safe to use and an older bottle, not so much. So I always tell people, just spend the 10 bucks, get yourself a brand new bottle, have it ready for emergencies. And if something goes wrong, or if you're doing a big thing with your tank, or your tank goes through some crazy ordeal, you can go ahead and you can put Prime in immediately to help lock everything up to keep the livestock safe so it won't die off. Um, let's see, I lost track of this chat. Yagi one says, are you coming to Reefstock Denver? No, my next spot will be uh, the Macna in Atlanta, which is April 1st and 2nd. John says, is there an update on the cube tank? It's an empty spot right there. No update yet, haven't had time. I'm literally trying to take care of customer orders for people that are waiting for their stuff and I'm about to leave town and I'll be gone for a week. So I um, am just in a holding pattern when it comes to the tank. But pretty much everything's doing well in the temporary tank that I set up in the fish room for the anemones and clowns. There's one coral that I put at the very bottom, but it's not doing well. And I'm going to reach in through all the tentacles today and pull it out and put it in the reef so it can recover. I think the anemone is just laying on top of it and touching it constantly. And it's really ruining a really nice coral that I like a lot. So I want to remove that before it gets trashed. Manuel says Spock wants her nori. Well, there's a tiny bit on the clip, and I can't just stop the show and go put nori in the tank today. Wow. Michael Baldwin says that Live Rock at his fish store is $24 a pound. Wow. That's a lot. I am very surprised it's that high. Uh, Nick says, we tested our tank today and the alkalinity was 6.2, which is a little low, and calcium was 535. We dosed to raise our alkalinity, but how can we lower the calcium? You really can't, but what you could do is double check that and test the calcium one more time to make sure that you get the same reading twice. If both times you get a 525 reading, like you said it was, 535, I would then not dose calcium probably for as much as a week or two. I would check the water every couple of days with the test and see where the numbers are. Calcium will slowly deplete down as it's being utilized by the livestock in the system. Just don't put any more in. If uh, that doesn't work, then maybe some water changes that have salt water with a lower calcium level in the mix would help to dilute down your calcium level that's up there right now. But our goal is 375 to 450, so 535 is rather high. I want to bring that down. Paul says, I swapped my rock out as it was infested with Aptasia. It's currently out on top of my shed in the rain at five degrees. <laughs> How long better rinse and reuse? I would get it out of the rain because rainwater is not exactly what we consider clean water. It has all kinds of stuff that's misting down from the skies and it is polluting the rock. So you're going to, like I said earlier, you got to put it in a barrel of salt water, let it circulate, throw a lid on top. Um, and then, you know, like I said, in four to six weeks, that rock will be more likely to be usable. Lincoln says, if I were to pull out a big rock that's been in my tank for five years with seven anemones on it, will it create a swing in my tank? No, uh, you'll create a giant void in your tank with a lot of space because I'm sure the rock and the anemones take up a lot of real estate. But um, you're going to want to pull them out and put them... I keep saying barrel because you need a barrel. You need something big that can have a lot of water so you can put that thing in there with all the anemones on there. And then I guess you're planning to do something like peel the anemones off maybe, and you can do that. You can remove them one by one from the rock. And then you can even look at the rock and see if it needs to be cleaned. I'm not a big fan of scrubbing rock, but you could essentially do that. Or you could just basically just kind of hit it with a power head to blow off all the waste you can and then move it back into your tank. But as long as it was submerged the whole time, you could even put it back in your tank safely. 
But while that big rock is out of the way, that'd be perfect time to clean the sand bed under that one area where the rock had been. Uh, Alex says, I have a 20 gallon tank. It's got an inch and a half sand bed. I set it up in the new house and I'm transferring everything as we speak. I'm scooping the sand. I don't stir. Oh, and so it's creating a big cloud. So listen, if the sand bed is more than six months old in the old tank, then you're going to want to replace it with clean new sand. If you, I would not like scoop out of one tank and put another tank because you're going to unleash all kinds of horrible stuff into the water. <laughs> it's just not a smart move. Now, what you can do if you're, you're not willing to go buy a new bag or two of sand from the fish store, which is the simplest, easiest job right now, just to move forward with your life, you can actually wash all that sand, but you have to be able to do it outdoors with a garden hose. And I don't know where you are right now, but where I am, it's 37 degrees. And I don't even know if I can get water through a garden hose right now. I think my hoses might still be full of ice from yesterday. So if you cannot literally rinse the sand clean to uh, get all the detritus out, I would just go buy a, a brand new bag of sand. And if you're gonna buy sand at the fish store, they're gonna have two kinds usually. They'll usually have live sand and they'll have dry sand. You can get one large bag of dry sand and one small bag of live sand. You can get two small bags of live sand. You can just put in live sand and uh, just get your tank going. The Like you said, as you're putting stuff in and it's clouding up the water even as you're scooping, it's because all that detritus is in there and you need that detritus gone. You do not want to move that into the new tank in the new home. Uh, you want that gone. So I would definitely recommend that. Yeah, I understand. You're, you're, I get what you're saying. You're trying to keep things stable and you're trying to use some of it. What you can use is like one or two cups of the old sand. And after you put the new sand in the new tank, then put that cup or two, like two little anthills on top of the sand bed and don't try to spread it out or thin it out or anything. Just leave the hills there. And then when you turn on the flow in the tank, it'll just level itself out and the bacteria can populate in the upper half inch of your new sand bed. Um, Kat says, is it important to keep the rock in the water as when live rock and some corals are shipped, they're shipped in wet newspaper on export? Yeah, because the rock that's being shipped or exported or imported, that rock doesn't immediately go into a tank full of animals. That usually goes into a big trough, and then eventually the fish store says, now it's safe to use. So when you're getting rock shipped to you, if it's wrapped in wet newspaper or you're getting corals wrapped, those are different situations. Corals, way different, because you can literally dip it, and then it can literally go into your tank. Uh, or it could go into a quarantine tank for observation for a little while before it goes into your tank. But rock... It's got, it's, it's porous. It's got a lot going on within it. It's not just a rock. <laughs> and so we want to be really cautious with it and not just put things in and expect it all to work. The more we try to rush something, the more things are going to go wrong. And it's really important to take this hobby for what it is. It, you are growing some nature in your home and Yet it's nature, it's science. It's not something we can coerce into doing what we want. You, not long term. You know, you might be able to set up a tank in a day. It looks fantastic and you have a party that night. But then over the next week, you might just watch it decline because it wasn't ready yet. It, things have to happen when they happen. And all we can do is set everything up properly for the best chance for success. But if we rush anything, if we do things too rapidly, it usually comes back to bite us on the butt. Any more questions? Uh, remember, today is water test Saturday. We do want to test our water. We want to test for everything. Alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, nitrate, salinity, temperature, potassium. Uh, these are all the important elements we check for reef tanks. Um, if you're dealing with hospital tanks and quarantine tanks, you may be looking at ammonia, nitrite, nitrate. Uh, you know, we want to make sure those are okay. But uh, if you're not testing, you are literally putting your livestock at risk. And we want to stay on top of this stuff and make sure that we are doing a good job 
because we chose to do this. You know, I was just wondering the other day, I don't, I've never owned a swimming pool in my life, but I do know swimming pools have to be tested and you have to put in certain chemicals to make it safe for humans. Do they test the water in a swimming pool every single week? Do you, does anyone know the answer to that? I'd love to know. I thought about going down to the pool store and asking them just to have the knowledge. Emmanuel says, I'm at week two of my SPS quarantine, 30 more days to go. That's really impressive. It's, it's not easy to quarantine SPS corals. Uh, you have to set up a really stable ecosystem for a six week binge. Um, he said, I just managed to get stability with the uh, Tropic Marin all for reef, doing lots of testing, but everything is stable. That's, that's perfect. So do a good job and keep those corals happy. And then you can go ahead and you can put them in your tank without any concern. And you know, the nice thing is when things are in quarantine, usually you can get a better look at them than you can in the reef because there's always things in the way. And in quarantine, they're near the front of the glass and you can kind of observe them and you can see if there's any kind of hitchhikers that snuck in. You can see if they're good hitchhikers or if they're bad ones. You know, sometimes you might discover something really, really neat. Or sometimes you might discover something you're glad is not in your tank yet. Uh, Kat says, would you rather have wild fish, wild caught fish, or captive bred fish? It's kind of a 50-50 thing. I mean, sure, I, I have a lot of captive bred fish in my system, but uh, some fish are not captive bred yet, and so you have to get wild caught. But, you know, in the past, we also learned that getting wild caught fish were not guaranteed success stories. And a lot of times, if it didn't go well, you said, oh, I was wild caught. <laughs> I mean, it was like the de facto, oh, well, of course, it was well caught. Of course it didn't work out. But um, that really shouldn't be the rule. That's not really a great explanation for why something didn't make it. Wow. Sean says, we have to test our public pool three times a day by law. Three times. Okay, so uh, one person said they test weekly. One person said daily. This person says three times a day. So you're testing your pool and the point of my analogy was you test it so that when you get in, you're safe and your children are safe. So you don't get sick. You don't get pink eye or, or an infection. Uh, you know, you don't get anything. That's the point. You just want to be able to swim and have a good time. And you don't want to, you know, end up sick as a dog. So the same thing goes, we test our aquariums so that they won't be sick as a dog. We make sure all the fish are healthy and that everything's going really well and that the corals can thrive. And obviously there's only certain things we can test for. And there will always be some little mystery in our tank we can't quite put our finger on, we don't have the answer to, and we're trying to solve the puzzle or the riddle of what's going on. Maybe eventually you'll, we'll come to the point where we test every single bit of the DNA and we know everything. I don't know. But for now, we do have some of the basics, and we've learned that if you set up a certain amount of filtration and you apply a certain amount of maintenance and you follow up with your testing, then you're going to have the best chance for success as a reef keeping hobbyist. Uh, John says, any thoughts on turning your skimmer, I think there's a word missing, off at night? Seen a few threads on the topic lately. Oh, yep, and then he said it right there in the very next reply, off. So my thoughts are no. <laughs> no, I would never do that. Now, the protein skimmer does two things. It captures the dissolved organic compounds, or docs, in the water column, and it does it 24 hours a day. So whenever there's something in the water column, it will help to capture it on a bubble and bubble it up to the top of the cup and get it out. It also is driving off CO2. It's not adding air to the tank and to the ecosystem, but it's pushing away the CO2, which helps to drive up the pH of the aquarium. So having a protein skimmer on all the time is pushing away CO2 all the time. Now, if I was turning off a protein skimmer, I just can't, I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't turn the skimmer off. Now, I understand why some people are saying they want to do it. There's a few people out there that have started to say the protein skimmer is taking too much stuff out. And it's starving your tank. And that is why your tank's not doing well. So if you just turn off your skimmer for this many hours every night, or if you turn it off 
this many hours every day. Or if you just don't run a skimmer, you can have a very healthy tank. Well, it's all relative. It comes down to the livestock. If you were looking at a tank full of softies, zoanthids, recordia, devil's hand, zinnia, probably don't even need a protein skimmer. I mean, you, you don't absolutely have to have one, but I find for reef keeping, it's the best process to have one. Now, the, the premise of not having a skimmer running as much is to help those tanks that have zero nitrate and zero phosphate to attain some nitrate and phosphate. So they say skim less. And my question is, well, what's happened to the pH of the tank? What's happening to the CO2 level? And if you can control those numbers at the same time, or you can just dose nitrate and phosphate until your tank has nitrate and phosphate. That's the other choice. But uh, no, I, I run a skimmer on every tank I run. The only time I don't run a skimmer is when I'm cycling a tank. A brand new tank that goes up from scratch and it takes three weeks to go through the cycle. I have no lights turned on and I have no skimmer running. I just have top off and flow and I wait and wait and wait and wait. And I look at it and I clean the glass and I uh, just wait for the cycle to complete. And then once it's completed, I can do a small water change and then I fire up the skimmer and it, it just starts skimming out stuff. And you can look at the skim mate. It's already pulling out some brown stuff. And with a brand newly cycled tank, you should have very low nitrate and possibly almost no, not, no phosphate at all because there's nothing in there to give it phosphate other than what may be emanating out of rock, possibly out of the sand bed, you know, out of the new sand. But um, then as you add livestock and you add food to the feed the fish and food to feed the corals, then you will begin to add traces of nitrate and phosphate with every meal, as well as every time they pee and poop in the water, they're adding a little bit to the system that creates that nitrate and phosphate that we're so busy trying to export with a protein skimmer. But uh, no, I have no desire to not run a skimmer on a tank. And um, I've always, like I said, Uh, Thomas says, how can I contact you? You can email me at sales at milosreef.com. Dean says, I've not seen a live stream for a while. Where is the beard? Well, it's back on the older live streams. Dean says, my calcium is over 500 because of my reactor. I can't slow it down because I need to keep my alkalinity reading at the moment at 8.5 but my calcium will not come down. You know, you should test the effluent. I've never done this. You should test the effluent of the calcium reactor. I'm assuming it's calcium reactor, not caulk reactor, not some other reactor, but just a calcium reactor and see what the calcium level is coming out of the calcium reactor. I'd be curious to know what that number is, but uh, 500 being up there, it's just a little high. It's 50 ppm higher than we want. Um, but usually calcium reactors don't add calcium to the tank. They kind of just maintain it. I've never, in all these years, dosed calcium. Never. And you know, lately, I've kind of wanted to. <laughs> I kind of want mine to be up a little bit higher. I actually have to go get myself some calcium chloride if I want to do it. But uh, a calcium reactor is, by definition, if you go dig into this, it's an alkalinity reactor, which is the crazy part. Um, and it will maintain your alkalinity but i do not believe it will ever raise calcium in a tank i think it'll just maintain it because my number tends to always be right around 400 400 400 425 400 380 400 i mean it's almost always 400. eric has been a member of this channel for nine months. Congratulations, Eric. <laughs> Thank you for being so loyal. And Kat is breeding all kinds of cool stuff. Trying to breed uh, Royal Grama, Pearly Jawfish, Neon Dottyback, Cleaner Gobies, Citron Gobies, Filefish, Skunk Clowns, Blue Eye Cardinals, and Splendid Dottybacks. That's awesome. Sean says, now do you have the skylights? Oh, I've had them for like eight or nine months. Uh, do you still have them turn on and off at, at a time you had your halo set up or do you have them all ramp up? Um, I am not doing the staggered lighting if that's what you're asking me. I did that for about a decade and I kind of miss it, <laughs> but I've not tried to trick the skies into it. The schedule is kind of, um, 
I think I would actually have to isolate them from one another and have to actually do the homework to even figure out if I could do it. I mean, I know I can, but I'd have to figure out how I could do it. So I would actually, like right now, they're all co-joined together. So if I program it, they all match the code. If I were to make them independent, then I would have to put in the code to do the staggered lighting. And then when I want to change the color spectrum, I'd have to go into each one and change the color spectrum, I bet, which might make it more of a pain in the butt and not really a benefit to doing the staggered lighting. Anyway, I did it for a long time and now I'm not doing it. I decided to change everything. I've been doing a lot of changing this last year or two and uh, it's not all, I don't hate it all. <laughs> Some changes are nice. John says, I've got that same shirt. So it says, keep calm. That's it, there's nothing underneath. <laughs> Besides my belly. I just thought, considering what's going on in the Ukraine, we need some keeping calm right now. So that's why I put on this shirt today. Uh, John asks, is there any uh, go-to calcium reactor media these days? Well, ARM has been around forever, which is aragonite reactor media from Caribc. And then I've been using Reborn, yeah, Reborn by Two Little Fishies for, I don't know, five or six years. The Reborn we used to get, I loved. The new Reborn we get, I don't love as much. And I saw a video on Bulk Reef Supply that talked about, they compared different calcium reactor medias. And apparently Reborn was the one with the highest level of phosphate coming off the media. So that's not great, but that didn't stop me from using it. <laughs> I like the media. I just, I liked the original kind better. But now that things have changed, you know, we just have to take what we can get or you have to change flavors. And I just don't have a desire to change flavors at this time. So I use Reborn and I stock it in my shop. Hello, Vivek from India. Sharks 3D Man says, when are we getting an update on the NIM tank? I just did an update like eight minutes ago. Where were you? There's nothing to update. Everything is in a holding pattern right now. All right. So I think I'm just going to stop here, guys. Like I said, I've got a lot to do. I'm leaving town in a few days, and I'll be gone for a week. There is no live stream next Saturday because of this, because I'll be on the road. And uh, I'm off to see family. And I haven't seen them in over two years, so I want to go do that. And uh, it occurs to me... This is probably too much information. That I can make a trip back through Tucson where my mom lived and I can bring home her ashes. So I've got to make arrangements for that as well because that has been set aside for me for over a year and I'd like to get her. So, ah, difficult stuff, guys. Um, in the meantime, I'm just trying to work as much as I can to get as many orders completed before I leave town. If you are a customer right now waiting for something from my shop, I um, will do my best. If I cannot get it to you in time, I will be filling orders when I return. So there will be a slight lag for some customers. Some people are expecting it. They know they knew when they placed a custom order for some acrylic work that it would be a while till they got it because of my trip. But uh, other than that, I hope you guys have a safe weekend. If you are over in Europe and near the Ukraine, or in the Ukraine and watching this, I am, my heart is going out to you. I've been reading all the news. I am totally on top of every snippet of what's going on. And I hope for the best for this outcome. I, I personally would like to see Russia stop. That is my personal opinion. Other than that, um, 